kind enough to donate uh, tickets to the November 12th game, so email me, that's my email, um, and we'll get you tickets. Um, save the date, November t uh, 10th, uh, we're going to have our Veterans Day celebration on campus. If you want to volunteer, uh, our organization email, mainlawbso uh, at gmail.com. Um, any questions, anything like that, that's the email to direct it to. So, um, we're here today, we're talking about veterans, and uh, a lot of times I think people, they, they have conceptions in their mind of, of what a veteran is, um, but it, basically it's anyone who served in uniform for any period of time, uh, in any branch, um, in any status. So when I say branch, I'm talking about the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, uh, Air Force, uh, or status, that's active duty, reserve, National Guard. Um, and so I, I kind of I use this graphic because uh, it illustrates while you're in, it's very structured, uh, your day-to-day -day life, the support system you have around you. And um, so any issues you have, uh, whether it be your health care, anything like that, you are literally on base with everything you need. So when I was in the military, Fort Bragg, if I was sick, I walked 100 feet to the, our medical clinic right there, I walked in, just showed my ID, everything was taken care of, you know, and, and that was it. If I had an issue with pay, uh, again, the finance people within walking distance, everything was taken care of, there was a structure. <clears throat> um, but when you get out, it, it's not, uh, you're serving with the Department of Defense, and then you kind of come under the purview of the Department of Veteran Affairs. And there's not really a traditional handshake uh, that hands you off between the two departments. Um, and, and in fact, there's a little bit of a disconnect. Uh, and they tell you when you're out processing uh, what to expect and, and the benefits you can apply for. But most of the time when you're getting out there, you're more excited about getting out of the military. Uh, so you're not really paying attention to, to all that. Um, so then when you go to apply for benefits, uh, it, 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 can be a little, um, it can be a little daunting. And, and uh, so that's, that's why uh, sometimes uh, I brought a couple of handouts that when you apply for benefits, um, you get a decision. And whether it's um, positive, negative, you get the benefit, or whatever it is, they, they send this to you. They attach it to every, um, every decision. So I'll just pass this out. But it's kind of interesting. It, it talks about um, if you don't like the decision, what you can do. And, um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, the other thing I'll hand out is when you're discharged, I'm sorry, uh, everybody gets a, uh, it's called a DD-214. It's a summary. It's a one page summary of everything you did in the military. And this is kind of, this is the key to, to getting any sort of benefits. This proves that you serve. And so I made a copy of mine. Uh, so you can see what it entails, what it includes. So now we talk about VA benefits. Um, it's kind of broad categories. Education. I think everybody's familiar with the GI Bill. Everybody's heard about that. Um, there's also VA healthcare. Um, if you meet certain requirements, um, you can get VA healthcare. There's home loans that the VA will um, you apply for. The VA will back. Uh, vocational rehab um, is kind of along with education, but uh, traveling along with uh, disability as well that gives you money to go back to school. Um, life insurance, when you're in the military, you, you're under what's called Soldier's Group Life Insurance, SGLI. You can transition to VG, VGLI, Veterans Group Life Insurance. And then we get to what we're talking about today, compensation and pensions. That's kind of uh, disability. Um, I'll just give a scope of main what we're dealing with as far as VA facilities. The big one is TOGUS. Are a lot of people familiar with TOGUS? Have you ever heard of it? It's just outside of Augusta. That is like the main, uh, it, it, it's a campus really. It's, it's massive. And they have a hospital there, but also all the administrative offices. Everything's there. If you're a veteran in Maine, you're going to go to TOGUS at some point. Um, but they also have, for healthcare needs, they have outpatient clinics that can see you. Uh, general practitioner care, things like that. And I listed all the, the cities that have them. Uh, there's also vet centers that can, it's more 
information, they can direct you in the right path, but uh, not necessarily do the things that say tokens can do. Um, and obviously, in more rural regions that we're dealing with, Caribou, uh, Lewiston, they have mobile centers, and then the National Cemetery of Togas. Um, so when we're talking about uh, VA disability compensation, I took this right from the website so that everybody can read it. <laughs> That's the VA's definition. So everybody can read it. So, <laughs> but uh, just that's how they define it. Um, and then as just quickly go over, there's some opportunities for law students. Um, if you want work more information, again, email us at mainlawvso at gmail.com. Uh, and I'll, I'll put you in the right path wherever you're trying to do. Um, especially with the, uh, if everybody's an ABA member, uh, there's a great program called Duty Bound. Um, so there's a form that you can fill out that goes with that. Again, uh, feel free to email me. So I'll hand it off to uh, Mr. Jackson. And uh, yeah, thanks. Can I ask you to put that slide with the VA yes. compensation back up? Absolutely. Three slides ago. There we go. That's it. Neil was kind enough to invite me to come and speak today, and uh, he asked me to talk about how I got into representing veterans, uh, what that entails on an ongoing basis, and what some of the common types of issues that we see, and uh, to leave room at the end for some questions, so we'll do that. Um, I, the way I got into representing veterans is really sort of a back door. I, I uh, started out my practice doing uh, a very general practice, lots of uh, litigation, did a lot of court-appointed criminal stuff. And if you do court-appointed criminal stuff, as you may know, you end up doing a lot of appeals because you mostly lose a lot. Um, so I ended up doing some appeals, and uh, I, I was lucky enough to have a uh, case that went very well for me in 81, the uh, state of Anaya, and got me some attention as a public lawyer. And, uh, after that, I, a few years later, I, I did a case in 91, <coughs> Bolino, that went to the First Circuit, and that got some attention. And as a result of that, uh, shortly after that, uh, a lawyer here in town got in touch with me and said, gee, I've got somebody who wants to appeal, and it's to some court in D.C. that I don't know anything about, and do you want to do it? And I said, sure. You know, I, I uh, thought I knew all about the law, and so I, I just said that was fine. And, I took on this case and I'm scratching my head saying, too, never heard of this court before. And so I started looking around and lo and behold, um, I'd never heard of it before because it didn't exist before. They just created it. And what, what happened is in 1988, Congress passed a statute that created what was then called the uh, Court of Veterans Claims, uh, Court of Veterans Appeals, excuse me. And it uh, was the first time that the VA's decisions on things like compensation and pension have been made reviewable in the courts. Now, that's sort of an odd concept for lawyers. We think of agency decisions as being generally reviewable in the courts. Uh, but uh, up until 88, um, the VA pretty much was protected from court review. And so they had this kind of insular little system of their own that was supposed to be kind of paternalistic. And uh, nobody really got to. Uh, to challenge it very much, although there are, there are a few kind of, if you think back historically, there are some sort of odd cases uh, challenging the VA on various things, but, but not routine review of their administrative decisions. And for those of us uh, who go to law school, you know, we tend to think that administrative decisions are routinely re reviewable. You know, the the uh, APA uh, kind of kind of a similar system of review for social security decisions. That stuff's all reviewable, but the VA was not. And so in 88, Congress passed the statute, set up this court, and it took them a while, obviously, to set up the court, but they issued their first actual decision in, the, in December of 89. And if you go back to the very beginning of the Veterans Appeals Reporters, you'll see that volume one starts with the decision December of 89, goes up through into 91. Anyway, I got this call in 91, and I took on this case, uh, Mrs. Smith, and if you uh, are bored sometime, you can go and read it at, to 2 Fed App at 241. Uh, it's sort of an odd case. It's about presumptions. Uh, 
there's a presumption that if you get hurt while you're at, or killed while you're on active duty, um, that it's automatically service connected and you're entitled to benefits and so on. Except if this willful misconduct, and in this case they were arguing willful misconduct, and we have a big fight over how the presumptions apply. And anyway, Ms. Smith uh, got a remand and went back for another, another try at her benefits. And that's how I got into the thing. But it was it was sort of fascinating. Um, I, I literally had not heard of the court, so I had to figure out where it was and how you got in touch with them. And then I had to apply to become a member of the bar of the court. And we went through all that. But then we started trying to figure out how do you brief this case? Well, that's very interesting because there were no precedents. You know, they had literally one one volume of precedents. Uh, and None of them talked about willful misconduct. So, so but we went out and dug around and uh, we scared up some uh, JAG opinions that talked about what was willful misconduct. And we dug into right and over that talked about how presumptions work. And we put this brief together and had an oral argument and eventually won and got revanded. So that's how I got into the VA stuff. And I liked it. I thought it was kind of interesting. And you know, there were some sort of oddball issues. And, Nobody knew much about it, so it wasn't like I was any further behind the curve than anybody else. So uh, I started doing it, and you know, now I've been doing it for some 20 odd years. And if you, if you go on the, the court's website and put up my name, you'll find a couple hundred cases, um, most of which are not reported. And the reason that they're not reported is in one bad app, you'll find a decision called Frankel. And Frankel says, gee, you know, we have the right under the statute, unlike most appellate courts, to do most cases by single judge decision if we want to, instead of taking the time of three judges and clerks and so on. And so for efficient processing, uh, we're going to say that anytime it's simple, we can do it as a single judge opinion. And so you will see over the years that most of the decisions coming out of this court um, are single judge opinions. They're non-precedential. They are reported, but they're not precedential. And so you can really only use them for ways to figure out what kind of argument you might want to frame. You can see what the, some single judge said about it. And obviously, if uh, that was persuasive to him, it may be persuasive to a panel or to the other judge that you're in front of. And so that's one of the ways that, uh, that you can work with these things. But, um, Turning, if I may, to, uh, to Neil's sort of second topic, what the work entails on a daily basis, let me kind of walk you through the process a little bit because it's, uh, it's not intuitive, believe me. Uh, but Neil was explaining to you that when you get a decision from the Veterans, uh, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs, now it used to be the VA, but the Department of Veterans Affairs, you get one of these little notices. And this notice says that um, if you're unhappy with the result, you can appeal. And that the appeal from the regional office is to something called the Board of Veterans' Appeals. And the Board of Veterans' Appeals is this board in Washington that has review authority over individual veterans' benefit decisions in most of the areas that Neil had up there earlier. Um, you can appeal over things like uh, whether you're entitled to payment of um, certain medical bills, whether you're entitled to GI benefits in the loan, company, the loan area, various other things. But primarily, the issues that go up are compensation and pension, which is why you have this compensation thing up here. But the, the process is, you make an application to your local office, your local regional office with the VA. And every state has at least one regional office. Some big states have more than one. Um, the, the agency makes a decision, um, typically on the paperwork, it's very rare for anybody to actually have a, any sort of hearing at that level. And then, um, originally you went right from that decision on an appeal to the Board of Veterans' Appeals. The VA has now instituted a, an optional intermediate step that they call the Veteran Review Officer, uh, VRO, um, DRO, excuse me, decision review officer uh, process. <coughs> and that's intended to have uh, a senior person look at the decision, um, look at any additional evidence you have, to try to resolve it at the local office 
without sending the case to the Board of Veterans' Appeals, which is always backlogged and has huge numbers of cases waiting, and they're trying to keep those down. So uh, they have this, the initial decision, you lose, you go to the decision review officer. If you lose, um, you only can go to the board at that point, to the Board of Veterans' Appeals in Washington, or uh, you can also go back and reapply if you want. But, um, once you've, uh, once you've gotten to the board level, uh, for those of you who know historically, there's an alumnus from uh, UMaine who uh, was chairman of the Board of Veterans Appeals for a while, Charlie Cragen. And um, Mr. Cragen, uh, among other things, besides getting a lot of uh, UMaine graduates employed by the Department of Veterans Affairs, um, also got the, uh, the title changed. He, uh, he wanted everybody to be a judge. So the, Members of the Board of Veterans' Appeals now are veterans' law judges. Um, and that's intended to give them kind of commensurate status with typical federal government administrative law judges. And so uh, at the board level, you get another shot at uh, a decision. And again, this, this is an odd body from, from a lawyer's point of view. It is both a reviewing body and an initial fact-finding body. So you can present uh, live testimony, you can present evidence, you can do anything that you could do before a typical administrative hearing officer, but he is also sitting in a review capacity of the decision below. So um, it doesn't make a lot of difference because since they're doing everything in terms of taking new evidence and so on, ultimately it's basically a new decision and you get to make those arguments. The, the board um, does decisions three ways. You can go to uh, their office in Washington, over here. You can have a video hearing uh, from somebody in their Washington office linked with the regional office where you are, at Togus, for example, or Manchester, New Hampshire, or White River, Vermont, or wherever you happen to be, um, Portland, Oregon, if you happen to be there. Um, and uh, the third way is they have what they call travel board hearings, which is to say members of the board travel to the various regional offices around the country, and you can have a hearing with a, a live person face to face. Um, we found that that seems to work better, but uh, you can you can get hearings any one of these three ways. And then if you lose, you get back to the body we were talking about at the beginning, the court in Washington. And uh, one of the unique things about it is it's an Article I court as opposed to an Article III court. And so all the people are appointed for 15-year terms, kind of like the, the tax court, the claims court, and so on. Um, and those folks um, sit uh, primarily, as I said, individually, but they also sit as panels of three or on bond is the entire court. There are currently seven judges, and uh, the, the most senior guy is automatically the chief, un unlike uh, the Supreme Court where you can be appointed as the chief. Um, whoever has seniority at the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, they're the chief. And so uh, that's, that's how that part works. But uh, the court typically hears oral arguments in maybe percent of their cases. Um, in, uh, in 92, they had something like 1,900 cases filed. Um, this year, I, I looked just before I came, and they're up to about 3,300 new cases filed so far in 2011. Um, so they'll probably hit you know, something close to 4,000 by, by the time they close their filings at the end of the year. And most of those get disposed of by single judge. But there are, there are a few every every uh, you know, every year um, that are done by uh, panels, and once in a rare while you get an actual en banc decision. But uh, those are very rare. But what we do day to day in these cases, most of the time, is simply to assemble the facts. You know, there's a tendency in law school you you read these cases and you sort of take the facts as given. Well. Obviously, somebody had to get those facts there in the beginning. And the thing that most non-lawyers have the most trouble with 
is understanding how to analyze what facts are going to compellingly demonstrate their claim. And particularly in these sort of, typically these compensation claims are about injuries or disease. So you're looking at some kind of a medical issue and you're looking at, again, a relationship between service, because it has to have, it has to be something that happened while active duty or was made worse by active military service. And that's actually not quite broad enough. It essentially is anything that was caused um, reasonably directly by your military service. For example, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, some of you have heard of Agent Orange. Agent Orange is this wonderful stuff that Dow Chemical made that they spread all over Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And it turns out that if you get exposed to that stuff, it can do bad things to you. Uh, can you do bad things to your kids? Um, and so there are a whole series now of diseases that are presumptively service-connected as caused by Agent Orange. But there are lots of other things that there's a real fight over whether it was caused by Agent Orange or, <clears throat> conversely, if the person was not in Vietnam but claims exposure to Agent Orange in another setting, uh, handling the stuff on shipboard, um, being exposed to it at Fort Drum when they tried it out, things like that, then you have a different issue about proof of exposure uh, plus the, the proof of the service connection. <coughs> so, Many of these cases turn primarily on obtaining the medical documentation to show that the injury or disease um, is related to service because what you have in a lot of these cases, you have somebody coming in and saying, gee, I was in the service, I hurt my knee, now I have arthritis in my knee, and the VA will say, you know, that's fine, we can see in your records that you hurt your knee in the service, we can see in your records that you have arthritis in your knee, but there's no medical evidence saying that one caused the other. And in fact, we've read your medical records, and after you hurt your knee, you complained about it for 30 days, and we never heard it about it again for the rest of your entire service career, and we don't think it has any relation to your current arthritis. So the place that most veterans have difficulty in presenting their own claims is making the connection between what happened to them in the service and whatever medical condition they're currently complaining of. And some of these things have special um, requirements, if you will. There's a large body of post-traumatic stress disorder claims uh, related to service in one way or another. And for a long time, there were some very narrow, very restrictive rules about proof of exposure to a stressor sufficient to cause PTSD. I'm happy to say that the VA, the little prodding politically, has now um, made it easier for veterans to make that connection. Um, but there are still some very difficult, special situations where proof of the stressor is, is problematic. Um, the ones that we run into most commonly are issues of assault, either physical assault or sexual assault in the service. Um, you know, I'm not a veteran, so I don't speak from any personal experience, but I can tell you that if you look at the case law arising from the court, or you look at cases at the board, Board decisions, for example, are, are posted online. You can actually go and look at board decisions. They, they blank out all the identifiers about you know, who the veteran is and so on. But you can go back and look at years' worth of, of Board of Veterans' Appeals decisions if you want. And you'll see that there are a lot of sexual assault cases, uh, sexual assaults against both men and women. And those cases are very difficult to prove because typically people are embarrassed. They, they don't want to. Uh, go and tell their commander that this happened. Um, you know, it often happened off base under circumstances where they were uh, perhaps intoxicated or whatever, and they, they're just very embarrassed to, to, to even talk about this to people. 
Sometimes they don't talk about it to anybody for years. And so it becomes quite problematic to prove the relationship. But those are the kinds of things that we do day to day. We spend a lot of time developing the facts, particularly the medical relationship facts, on individual cases. Obviously, we also do hearings. We go to hearings at the, uh, at the uh, regional office here in Tobis. We do live hearings with you know, travel boards. We do uh, video hearings. We travel around the country and do them. Um, I've just been told that I had the great joy of going to Oklahoma soon. Uh, but uh, in any event, um, we, we do these hearings. Uh, we do them all around the country. Uh, and. Uh, the, they're fairly, you know, they're fairly simplistic presentations. Usually, they typically the presentations at the board are not really about complex legal issues. I mean, the cases may have complex legal issues, but the presentations are typically about uh, fairly simple factual issues. Uh, typically, it's the veteran testifying. Sometimes we'll have um, other people testifying on their behalf, but. Most of the evidence beyond the veteran's testimony is stuff that's submitted in writing, uh, letters from the doctor, you know, affidavits from uh, somebody who was there at the time something happened, uh, buddy statements they're called in the VA parlance. Um, so most of what we do is really about gathering the evidence to demonstrate that this problem that happened in the service led to this medical problem that the, the veteran currently has that should be rated at this level uh, in the VA's compensation system. The, the compensation system is quite different from most other disability adjudication systems. At Social Security, for example, either you're disabled or you're not. It's, you know, it's very simple, okay. it's black and white, you're in or you're out. The VA, on the other hand, has a very complex staged system where you can be service connected anything from 0% up to 100%, and it may vary over your lifetime. It may vary even in short periods. Uh, for example, you have a 20% service connected foot problem, but it requires surgery and you have to be hospitalized for a couple months. You may jump up to 100% for that period while you're in the hospital and then back down to 20%. So you see lots of, of fluctuation in, in the levels of disability and the the corresponding levels of benefits go from quite modest to um, upwards of a couple thousand dollars a month, depending on the level that you're at. So our goal in each of these cases is to establish entitlement to benefits and then to establish the maximum level of benefits that each veteran client is entitled to. Most of the time, if somebody has a serious um, service-connected problem, we're ultimately going to end up with what they call unemployability or individual unemployability or TDIU, which stands for Total Disability Based on Individual Unemployability, which is a special thing that the VA does that lets you get paid as though you have 100% disability, even if you actually are at a lower percentage rating if your service-connected disabilities prevent you from working um, at any significant level. And so, in every case, we're going to look at what can we establish disability entitlement for, what's the maximum rating we can get the person, can we get them multiple ratings if there are you got a rating for the left leg, you got a rating for the right leg, you know? Um, and the VA has this incredibly complicated system where they don't add up the, the amounts of compensation. Instead, they sort of um, inversely geometrically multiply them so that it, a 10% a, uh, a, uh, rating and a 10% rating and a 10% rating and a 10% rating don't add up to 40%. They probably end up at 30%, if I remember the chart right. Um, but there are different, multi, you know, different combinations so that you get these odd things. Anyway, so we're, we're looking to maximize the benefits, and then, if possible, um, we want to get the person to 100% either based on their particular disabilities 
or based on individual unemployability by demonstrating that even though they don't add up to 100% on the VA's chart, the combined disabilities are so severe as to preclude the person from employment and thus entitle them to benefits on this other method. So we do a lot of it. Um, you will ask me to comment on the most common issues that we see. And keep in mind that we see a skewed set of claims. Um, people don't come to me unless they've been turned down with VA. So claims that are fairly straightforward and fairly simple just don't come. The, the VA will accept those. That's that. So the, the claims that we see tend to be claims that are either legally complex or factually complex. And typically, it's factually complex. Um, there are some legally complex issues. You know, we're talking about who's a veteran. You know, that sounds really simple on the surface, but if you ever go and read a case called Biggins from the court, you'll come away wondering why you thought it was simple. Um, there, are, there are some odd things, like uh, being in the National Guard, for example, doesn't automatically entitle you to be a veteran for court purposes under certain circumstances. It just gets very strange. Uh, so there are some odd legal issues. But um, mostly, these cases are about people not being able to develop the facts. And, you know, we routinely end up having to send people to specialists for evaluations to, to generate the medical evidence to make the connection between what happened to on active duty and the problem that got them. Uh, whether that's a psychiatric evaluation, an orthopedic evaluation, uh, a cardiologist's opinion, you know, that's that's this kind of stuff that we're, that we're working with. And we, we had one, what I, I think is a wonderful result recently. Uh, we got uh, the board to agree that uh, this gentleman died of stomach cancer and the board uh, ultimately accepted our experts position that it was at least as probable as not that his stomach cancer was caused by exposure to the constituent elements in Agent Orange. Um, stomach cancer is not one of the presumptively service-connected conditions for Agent Orange, but we were able to persuade the board that uh, this fellow's uh, stomach cancer should be related to his exposure to Agent Orange and uh, got his widow, unfortunately not him, uh, 10 years worth of back benefits for her DIC claim. Yeah. Um, I'm very proud of that one. I think that's we're the first ones in the country to have persuaded the board to do that. So we've had a, you know, there are, there are typically, uh, these, these kinds of claims, and as I'm saying, the, the ones that come to us are either legally or factually complex, but usually it's factually complex. Um, most of these cases do not turn on, on complex legal interpretation. There are some that do, but it's, that's, that's kind of the, the, the exception, not the norm. Um, the Smith case that I, that I started out with, uh, has this complicated issue of presumptions, but you don't run into a lot of that stuff. Mostly it's, it's just applying the facts. And I did want to touch on one thing that, that doesn't show up up here. Um, when you talk about the VA, there's compensation and there's pension. Those are not the same thing. And pension is, a, is an entirely different benefit, actually, that the VA has that is available only to people who served in what is designated as a period of war, um, whether it's Vietnam or Korea or the current conflict in the Middle East. Um, and that benefit is available to anyone who is disabled, who served in the requisite period of war. Uh, it, you don't get the same amount of, of benefits as if it's service-connected compensation, but um, it, it, is a, uh, it is a benefit that's available based solely on disability. You don't have to make the connection that you have to make for compensation between the causation of the condition and service. 
you just have to have been a service member, you have to have served in a time of war, and you have to be currently disabled and poor because you don't get very much money. But uh, it, <coughs> the VA, you can think of it, if, if you're familiar with the Social Security system, you can think of it as sort of the VA's equivalent of SSI. So those are kind of the, the basic things I wanted to touch on. Um, Neil, if I'm right on the time, it's about time for questions? Yep, absolutely. Okay, I'll be happy to answer any questions that anybody wants to throw out to the best of my ability. Sir. Uh, I'm still I'm an officer in the National Guard. Yeah. Um, and I've got a lot of, I just got up active duty, so I've got a lot of friends who are kind of going through the process. What would you say is the, the thing I can tell my soldiers to maybe smooth this over when they are on the outside? Is it documentation? Is it it's it? all about the documentation. The first thing I would tell them is make sure you get a copy of your service medical records because there's, I, I don't know if you've seen this stuff. I, I assume that um, a lot of people on active duty have seen this stuff, but there's been some very strange stuff coming out about mostly about a year ago where the military was just routinely destroying people's service medical records because they didn't have enough storage, so they just trash it. You know? um, and, and it's all about documentation. You know, if you can't document that you're injured, you need in the service, you're going to be in a world of hurt trying to establish that with the VA. So um, that's, that's the biggest thing. The, the second biggest thing is, I, I don't know a nice way to say this, so I'll just jump in and say it. Um, a lot of people in the military are reluctant to admit that they have PTSD type symptoms. And there are lots of reasons for that. You know, I, I don't pass judgment on anybody about their reasons for what they do. But I'm telling you that the people who fail to report those things while they're on active duty will have a harder time post active duty if they're dealing with the VA. And, you know, um, I've got a guy that works for me who graduated a few years ago and was a captain in the artillery. And he was explaining to me uh, a whole bunch of reasons why people don't report those things. And I understand, I'm good with that, but it may cause you problems. Um, so yeah, the, the biggest thing is the documentation and, and the records. Sir. Um, you've addressed some of the stuff with PTSD. Uh, can you address any of the specific situations with regard to uh, traumatic brain injury? Sure. Um, the first traumatic brain injury case I gave was a guy from Vietnam who had a uh, hatch cover fall on. Um, and apparently hatch covers are, are big head of guidance. Um, and he was, uh, he was hospitalized for a bunch of stuff, but they didn't talk about the head injury beyond saying that he had an abrasion. That, that was all they said about it. And after service, he had what I think you could safely characterize as a very difficult life. Um, he just really did not have good brain function. And ultimately, um, we got an opinion from a uh, a psychologist <clears throat> saying that if this hatch cover <coughs> hit the guy with sufficient force to cause these other physical injuries, it must necessarily have had impact on the brain and that the symptoms that he demonstrated, um, I, I don't know how familiar any of you are with, with psychological testing, but there's some fairly sophisticated psychological testing they can do called neuropsychological testing that that really is focused on demonstrating brain function and in fact can even tell you which areas of the brain are not functioning correctly. Um, and we were able to, to get um, those opinions and the testing and actually got a very helpful opinion from a psychologist who had worked with him while he, he, was, he was actually hired to work as a civilian on a military base in Colorado for a while and did terribly. Um, and the, the, a psychologist who worked with him there verified that in fact the kinds of behaviors that he demonstrated were consistent with uh, certain kinds of brain damage that were consistent with having somebody drop a hash cover on his head. Um, but more commonly now, I think the next one I did was a, a guy who was in a 
never remember the right term for the for the vehicle, but some sort of armored vehicle in, in Vietnam that, that got rolled over and he got hurt and he had a sort of similar problem. I mean, his, his symptoms were somewhat different, but it's the same kind of thing. They, they didn't document they had uh, a brain injury at the time, and so the VA kept saying, well, there's no record of you having a brain injury. What are you talking about? That's, that's your problem. Um, and uh, in fact, they, they tried to pass it off as a personality disorder for a long time. That's, that's a favorite of the view. Um, but I, I hope that generically answers your question. If there's something more specific, I'd be happy to address it. Go ahead. How do the clients know to come to you? They don't know that as well as I'd like them to. Okay. Um, you know, we we uh, we have a, a website. Um, we uh, have some brochures that we put out, but it's not really. I, I have to say that we have not done um, the greatest job of marketing the availability of our services to veterans. Um, and in fact, we're we're working on trying to do better about that at the moment, but. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty much word of mouth. We, we've been doing this long enough in Maine that the, kind of the word is out that, you know, if, if you're having a problem and you go see these guys, they may be able to help you. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of hit or miss. We, we do uh, some modest amount of advertising. If you look at the phone book, you'll see that our, our uh, Yellow Pages ads mention veterans uh, stuff. And we do some web stuff, and we're we've been working on um, recently uh, putting up some videos on the on the web that talk a little about veteran stuff and, and uh, indicate that we, we try to help people in this area. But it's pretty hit or miss, to be honest. Follow up question: I worked in an office that did personal injury plaintiffs bar, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of you know weeding out that happens. You know, when you look at a case, you say, "Is this a good case? Are we going to take it or are we not?" Yep. Is it a similar process? Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, the honest truth is I can't afford to take cases about the injury to your little toe. You know, it, it costs me more money than, than I'll ever get. Uh, in fact, let me talk about the fees just for a second because it'll, it'll make more sense. The VA has kind of an interesting fee system. Um, I can have a contingent fee with someone, and if I limit my uh, attorney's fees to 20% of any benefit, any past due benefits recovered, the VA will uh, withhold that money and pay me. And most of the time they actually do, although they screw it up some. They used to screw it up a lot, but now they all screw it up a little um, But you can actually have a higher fee if you're willing to forego the withhold. So if, if you have a client that you're working with and you feel like you have a relationship with them, and you trust them to actually pay you the money when they get all this money from the VA, uh, you can have a fee payment of up to a third. And there's some, the court hasn't actually talked about um, the increment between a third and 40%. They've said that 40% is unreasonable. Um, they've said a third is reasonable. And my guess is that you might get by with 35% if you tried. But, but the point of all that is, the we will be a case. If somebody wants me to go to Oklahoma, um, you know, I got to pay to fly there, I got to put on the case, I'm probably not going to get paid back if I lose. So um, I want to make sure, number one, it's a case that I think I have a reasonable chance of winning. And number two, a case where I think the person is going to get rated at a reasonably high uh, level, if it's just a single rating case, or uh, a case where I think the combined disabilities uh, are going to lead to TDIU or some other way that I am reasonably comfortable that if I have done a really good job uh, for this client, I'm probably going to get paid at a reasonable level. Um, but you know, these are these are not huge fee cases typically. I mean, uh, the average case we get a fee of you know five to ten thousand, and and that's over. You know, you, you probably have that case at, at least four or five years. Um, and so it, it makes it a tough area for people to kind of go into as a, as a standalone specialty. 
and we, we do it in conjunction with our, our social security case. And so the kind of the social security cases of regular cash flow and then the, the VA cases kick in once in a while. Um, there are people who do just VA, but if you look at, if you go on the web and you look at those people, what you find is they're mostly people who've been doing it a long time and they're mostly small firms that don't have huge overhead demands. Um, I don't I don't know of anybody that really can fund a big firm doing just VA because the cash flow is so erratic. But um, you know, and then every once in a while you get a case where the VA's been doing some poor guy a hard time for 10 years and you finally get the benefits and He's going to get twenty-five thousand a year for ten years, and it adds up. You know, you get a, you get a decent payday. But um, it's 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 like personal injury or any other. And you have to look at you know, is this a case that's economically viable for us? Because obviously, before we can help any more veterans, we have to stay in business. So you know, you have to make sure that you can do that. Um, but I, I think you know, there are there are lots of veterans out there. Sadly, there are lots of injured veterans now that. Work ten years ago, um, you know, young men and women have gone to uh, Afghanistan or to Iraq uh, and come back with problems. And I know that the military is doing a much better job than they used to do about things like PTSD. I also know that there's internal stigma about that, and so a lot of people aren't as forthcoming about that as they might be. And I'm guessing, and it's really just a guess, but I'm guessing based on my experience with the Vietnam vets, that 20 years from now, you're gonna see a real wave of PTSD cases where people have never really said, you know, I'm, I'm fessing up that this is my problem. They've just tried to stick it out. And what happens with people who do that is, you know, it works okay for some of them, but a lot of them, you get out of ways and they just get overwhelmed and they start to not function. I mean, you get these guys from Vietnam and they, they, they get back and they, they kind of had a tough time at first, but they sort of get their feet under them and maybe they get married, they get some support and they go along for a while and then they just kind of slowly fall apart. Um, you know, one of the saddest cases I've ever done is this guy who was a truck driver in Vietnam. And, uh, because of the lack of any real safe haven in Vietnam, uh, when they do these convoys, they would tell them they couldn't stop for anything, didn't matter what it was, couldn't stop. He had a five-year-old girl wander out in front of him, he didn't stop. And it's just wandering forever. I mean, I, I even have trouble with talking about it, but it just, I mean, it just it eats them alive. And I think, uh, I think you're going to see um, a rash of those cases from Afghanistan and Vietnam in about a 20, 25 year time frame. Because that's the period when people seem to just kind of, it gets to the point they can't keep it under control. Anymore. And luckily, as I said, I, I know the service has made what for them are enormous strides. I mean, truly enormous strides in, in trying to deal with that. And I, I think you will see if you, if you kind of compared on a per capita basis between Vietnam and the current conflict, I think you'd see a, a much smaller proportion of claims. But given the, the numbers of people that have been deployed, I think you're going to see a lot of those claims. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, this is specifically regarding disability compensation, but do you um, deal with a lot of claims by dependents? Because like, I'm the daughter of 85 like, disabled women. We see some of that, not, not typically in the educational setting, I mean, that, that, that comes up once in a while, but, but more commonly we see claims where, uh, like Mrs. Smith, it's, it's, a, it's the, the basic GIC claim, the dependency and the compensation, compensation claim for the uh, widow or widower of the former service member who's, who's now died, and they're saying, gee, um, this death was related to a service-connected injury or disease, and the VA said, no. Uh, it's, it's like, um, 
I was working on one recently at, at, at a home at a where uh, the person had PTSD and died of heart-related problems. And we got a great letter from the doctor saying um, the PTSD was, you know, just caused this guy to be in such constant stress and anxiety that it did terrible things to his heart. And I think that the PTSD really was a major contributor to his cardiological problems that caused his death. Um, and I, I think we're going to win that case. There, there are other cases like that that have been won. That's, it, it is, the, the VA acknowledges that there is a relationship between um, certain kinds of emotional stress, typically the PTSD cases, and cardiology type problems. But um, we don't see it so much in the, in the education context, but, but often in, the, in the, the claim for either dependency benefits or accrued benefits. Um, the VA has this rule where if, um, if you have a claim pending for um, any kind of uh, compensation benefits and you drop dead, your claim drops dead too. So your spouse then has to file a new claim um, of their own, although this, there has been some, there's been some some modification of that rule in the last couple of years, there are certain situations where um, the spouse is now allowed to step into the shoes of the veteran and pursue the claim, but it's still not, not the general rule. That's by far a minority. And mostly, the spouse has to start a new claim and go back and prove what he would have had to prove that he was disabled to get the benefits that were accruing on his claim while he was working on it before the poor guy dropped dead. And you see, I mean, one of the, the frustrating things about these cases is they can take an enormous amount of time. I, I literally, I swear this is true, I literally have a case I took on uh, in 1992 that I'm still working on. Uh, it's, it's been up to the court and back and up and back. It's it made it all the way to the Court of Appeals for uh, the Federal Circuit, which is the Court above the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims that reviews their cases um, a couple times. And it's just, you know, it, it's better than that. But um, I think we're going to win it someday. We all live long enough. Uh, but, you know, it's the, the problem with these cases is that if you go to the court and you win, 99 times out of 100, what you get is another term. Um, the way the law is structured, it is very rare for the court to be able to directly reverse the VA and say, just pay him. He's entitled to benefits paid. Most of the time, all the court can do is to say, no, you didn't give him a fair treatment. You've got to go back and do it over. And you know, if you have four or five do-overs that take two or three years apiece, you, know, you, you, you see where these add up pretty quickly. Um, and sometimes they take four or five years of this. Uh, you know, the, the VA moves incredibly slowly. I, I used to think when I, when I first started practicing, I thought Social Security was really slow. That's before I got to be able to be. Uh, <laughs> now I think VA, the Social Security people are really quick. <laughs> so, uh, other questions? Um, I, I actually think we're out of time. So sure. we have got to get to the contract. So, my but, apologies. I'll get out of the way. No, no, but thank you so much. <laughs>